Okay, so I'm supposed to test this line with music? Oh no, maybe I'll try the phone instead. experience with DOS back in the day was limited to whatever was on my family's computer. I played things like Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy, Commander Keen 4, Wolfenstein 3D, and Challenge of the Ancient Empires, but I was completely out of the loop with pretty much everything else. Lots of our diskettes came to us care of friends and neighbors rather than being brand new purchases, but there's one sweet little gem that I wish I'd had the chance to play back then. Ghostbusters 2. This story winds through many of the sequel's plot points, but it's pretty selective about which ones. You play as the Ghostbusters, who have fallen from the public's grace five years after saving New York City from Gozer and his servants. But the game opens with the courtroom scene that happens quite a ways into the movie. There's no mention of Dana or her baby at any point in the intro, or in any of the materials included with the game. But it seems that they went through quite a bit of trouble to include virtually everyone else in some way. Many of the actors that portrayed major characters were captured in portraits in the newspaper or some really great pixel artwork here and there, but Sigourney Weaver was nowhere to be seen. I actually found the fact that they glossed over all of the things that set the story into motion pretty funny, because the game very much expects that you're familiar with the movie's premise and characters. If you're not, the extremely fast-paced story scroll shouts out some of the finer details at you, but between its disjointedness and the limited blurb in the manual, you'll only have enough information to have a very surface-level understanding of what's going on. I've seen Ghostbusters 2 a grand total of twice ever, so admittedly, I wasn't able to enjoy the game as deeply as a mega fan familiar with every reference and detail would. With that said though, the lack of context didn't diminish my fun with it. I found the whole idea of slime feeding off the negativity of the people of New York eerily similar to a Sailor Moon plot. So many episodes of that show have minions of the Negaverse sapping people's energy for nefarious reasons, and the idea that Vigo the Carpathian has decided to go a similar route to resurrect himself made me chuckle. Even as silly as all this is, the stakes are pretty high. Check out what the manual says here. If you fail, you'll be pegged a menace to society and get thrown in Parkview Mental Hospital. If you succeed, you'll meet Vigo in a slime-slinging battle to the finish. Neither of those sound particularly pleasant. I don't know exactly how to classify Ghostbusters 2 in terms of a gameplay genre, since it does so many different things with none of them feeling at all conventional. It's almost like a collection of minigames, but what's great is that they're all interconnected, and your success or failure in them impacts other aspects of the game. The modes include passively collecting tunnel slime while avoiding spooks, some shooting gallery style arcade stages where you're trying to trap specters with a proton pack to make money, as well as rappelling down the side of a building to rescue your captured comrades in the hospital. This is only the first leg of the game, but we'll get into the other sections later. The manual is actually an extremely important asset in learning how to play well since there's no in-game instructions. It has detailed guides about how to approach each stage type, and even though it more or less tells you exactly what to do to win, knowing's only half the battle since you'll still need a ton of practice to pull it all off. I was actually surprised at how little wiggle room you have for making mistakes. For example, during the stages where you're catching ghosts around New York City, you'll visit a couple of different locations with not only the ghost you need to capture, but also a bunch of stuff that you can accidentally break. The goal here is to make enough money to keep the business going and eventually build the slime blower to pilot the Statue of Liberty, so you have to finish each stage as quickly as possible without destroying too much. The more precious CRTs or hot dog stands you blast to bits, the less money you'll get for the job, 
and without enough money, you go out of business and all the way back to the title screen to try again. I'll gladly admit that my curiosity got the best of me here. I just had so many questions about what could be interacted with. As much as I wanted to perfect my playthrough and win, blowing away layers of pixels to see what lay beneath was far too enticing to ignore. My favorite location was the department store, but maybe not for the reason most people would probably enjoy it. It seemed like it had the most stuff to bust up, but my sense of wonder extended to other areas too. The music was great in these parts, at least when I could hear it. The proton pack noises were extremely loud, and so loud in fact that it was impossible to hear the tunes while I was firing it. I would have loved an option to turn down the sound effects, but if there was one, I had no idea where to find it. I really appreciated the peaceful piano music that played during interludes between jobs. They were a welcome contrast to the chaos of the proton pack madness. When I wasn't living out my destruction fantasies, getting through these feats with enough cash was still much easier said than done because of the wily controls. The game does support a mouse or joystick if you can get one working, but I opted to use the keyboard instead. You navigate the reticle with the arrow keys and fire with the spacebar, and it's way harder than it looks to be accurate here. Many of the ghosts have a pattern that they usually stick to, but they'll occasionally do something completely unexpected, like teleport to the other side of the screen out of nowhere. Your reticle moves pretty slowly, so once they get ahead of you, it's difficult to cut them off and catch up to them again. I really appreciated how much effort the developers went through to pull in actual scenes and events from the movie. You get to see the Titanic pulled up to the harbor, as well as dealing with a runner in Central Park. These little touches were a clever means to tie the game to its source material, but were also interesting backdrops if you weren't familiar with the movie's shenanigans. The hardest of all these ghostbusting sessions was the courtroom at the very beginning that you're just thrown into right after the game starts. I actually thought this scenario was unwinnable for a while, since you have to nab both of the Scolari brothers. Catching one ghost is tough enough, but two is considerably worse, especially when you haven't even gotten a chance to practice yet. I should also mention that there's a lot more to this than meets the eye, like not overheating your proton pack, as well as making sure that any captured ghosts stay inside the trap. And that doesn't even account for the constant dodging to avoid getting hit by the ghost's fire and slime balls. In a regular stage outside this court scene, getting smoked by too many of those sends you to Parkview. But in the courtroom, it just ends the stage and starts your business 10,000 in the hole. After a lot of failures and getting thrown back to the beginning of the game too many times to count, I eventually got good enough to consistently bag both Scolaris and set myself up for a fighting chance to actually make some progress. As I started optimizing my runs with each attempt, I eventually decided that if I didn't win this encounter, I'd restart again. Beginning the game with a debt made it significantly harder to move on to the later stages, and it was just too tricky to make up money elsewhere. The main hub of the game is in Egon's lab, and I absolutely loved the graphics and vibe of this space. For one, everything's very obviously identifiable, and I never struggled to tell what anything was. More importantly though, everything just screams 1980s to me. Growing up back then really makes playing games with old tech like rotary phones, physical answering machines, and Tandy computers extremely nostalgic, and I felt right at home here. The rest of the game's also very nicely drawn and animated, and I loved the vibrant colors too. I especially enjoyed the digitized images from the movie, like the judge's angry face in the courtroom, or the portraits of the different Ghostbusters in the newspaper when they get admitted to the hospital. The sound on the other hand was… well, it was certainly something. The Bitcrest voice clips were ear-rattling, but also an endless source of entertainment for me. I don't know what scene they pulled this still image of Janine from for the phone call clips, but she looks like a welcomer to the underworld with those dark gaping eye sockets. I know they were dealing with the limitations of the time period, but Ghostbusters 2 had a fantastic style that really left me wanting to see more locations around the city. By the looks of how many discs came with this one though, I imagine what was already there was pushing the limits of what could be played on original systems back in the day. That still doesn't quell my need for some cool artwork in this game's world, and it would be great to see other locations around New York in this pixel art style. As a small aside here, while Ghostbusters obviously isn't a horror franchise, this ghost that appears as the end of the world is wrought is absolutely horrifying. If I'd played this as a kid, it definitely would have given me nightmares. I think my favorite part of the game was getting slime. 
There's something so relaxing about descending into the tunnels with only a scoop and some ragtime on the piano, with an occasional free-roaming vapor trying to shake you off to your doom below. It was unfortunate that there weren't any fun cutscenes with Venkman and friends trying to outsmart the police like they did in the movie, but it was also implied that they returned several more times for samples to complete their work. Maybe this was one of those times. There was a degree of randomness to some of these stages that kept them feeling fresh, but also a little unfair. For example, you never knew where this little green hand was going to pop up to grab you by the ankles. It creates this sort of anxiety and paranoia because it's so subtle. You don't even realize when it's happening right away. More importantly though, it was hard to know when a ghost was going to appear to try to knock you into the slime below. The grey one in particular was an absolute menace when he came out to play. No matter how hard I tried, I wasn't able to avoid getting hit by him, since you just couldn't climb out of the way fast enough. The even slower green ghost was also tough to avoid, but getting hit too many times here meant that you were being dragged away to the institution. I really enjoyed the whole idea of taming the many beakers of collected slime with music using the CD player back in the lab. This was an aspect of the game that was randomized each time you played, since only three of the nine possible tracks would be soothing, with the others causing the beaker to explode instead. The risks of needing to potentially collect slime nine times on the worst possible run seems excessive, but I learned that if you collect a sample and then go out on a ghostbusting job, Egon will slap on his favorite shower cap and assess the slime while you're out, ruling out one of the explosive options. This conveniently leaves the slime sample available to be tested a second time, which significantly cut down on my scooping time down in the tunnels. I did anything I could to avoid taking on more risks of losing my team to the hospital. The Parkview stages were a whole new level of difficulty. There were many times that I considered resetting the whole game if I was down one of my players, because getting them back was such a chore. The long story short is that the more Ghostbusters you have going into the next stage of the game, the better, so having all four of them in your group is something to really work for. The Parkview stages see one of your Ghostbusters rappelling down the side of the building, looking for the room where their friend is being held. And if you're wondering how you can tell which room is theirs, well, that's a great question. All the manual says is that there's an indicator that can be observed from the outside, but it doesn't say exactly what. If a shadow appears in the window, it might be your friend, or it might be one of the orderlies. I'm not going to spoil what the actual tell is, but the only way to know for sure is to bust through as many of the windows as it takes to find out. If it's your pal, they automatically climb down the building to safety in the absolutely gorgeous portrayal of Ecto-1A. But if it's not, a number of weird and interesting things can happen, some of which have grave consequences. The thing that frustrated me the most here was that the orderlies were only half the trouble. If they caught you, your next character would get committed, forcing even more pressure to mount another rescue. The workers are extremely hard to dodge when they rush at you. The manual says that you can avoid capture by moving towards them, but you have to be absolutely perfect in your execution not only once, but twice. And if you're even a little early or late, you're done for. If you happen to outmaneuver them, there's still the final problem of actually leaving the room to keep searching. You have to time your jump back outside, and considering how intense this experience is, it's really hard to be patient and figure out the rope swings to make your attempt. I believe there's a set rhythm, but given how many times I missed and plunged straight into the waiting arms of a worker, I can't say for sure. These parts were not only suspenseful, but also very funny to me. This game's actually full of little surprises, and once in a while I'd see something completely different in one of the patient rooms instead of two beefy attendants trying to tackle me, like this very long-legged nurse. They managed to make light of something that's normally a pretty serious situation, and that's not the only way that the developers infused their sense of humor into the experience. If you read the foreword of the manual, there's a fantastic personal story from the people that made the game, along with a photo of them dressed up as the Ghostbusters. It really gives you a feeling of how much these people loved the movies, and I think these three fellows captured something really special in the way that they approached making this one. The tone of the writing in the intro crawl, the witty manual banter, as well as how silly some of these scenarios are, made this experience a lot more light-hearted than I was expecting it to be. I think they captured the climate of the movie really well, but it was also refreshing playing something by a small development team that got to see their ideas fully realize, without too much corporate oversight like you might see with a modern Ghostbusters release these days. But anyway, if you manage to make enough money to stay in business, build the slime blower, and tame enough slime to spray into the Statue of Liberty, you can finally move on to the second part of the game. This picks up at the climax of the movie where your team maneuvers Libby through the streets of New York on the way to the museum, 
You get to jam out to this awesome rendition of Higher and Higher, but unfortunately, this is where the majority of my best runs came to a screeching halt. There's a lot to take in here. First of all, the controls are best described as unresponsive. You have to select which foot you want to move first, and then inch it forward before planting it down. I tried my best to follow the directions in the manual, but sometimes my input seemed to do nothing at all. Another problem here is that unlike in the movie where the streets were blocked off for the boys' march to the final conflict, in the game there are cars everywhere. I don't know who in their right mind would actively drive towards a giant moving effigy, but I digress. Every time you crush vehicles, you lose a little bit of energy off your gauge, and the more you lose, the slower you move. You're already contending with a very tight time frame to make it to the museum as it is. If you don't arrive by the stroke of midnight, you automatically game over, so you can imagine the struggle. You want to keep moving forward as much as possible, but also do it carefully so you don't end up moving slower than molasses and never making it there at all. It's a very hard thing to balance. Even though I squashed a lot of vehicles along the way, the even bigger issue at hand was turning the street corners. The game always starts you at a random block and requires you to make your way to the museum from that point. There's a map in the manual that's an absolute must for this part, but even knowing where you need to go doesn't mean that you're going to be able to do it in a timely fashion. If you have to turn a corner at any point other than first thing before you start walking, there's some very specific yet hard to execute instructions that you have to follow. The manual says that you have to place both feet in the middle of the intersection and that you'll be prompted to choose a direction after that. Well, let me tell you, when you can't see the whole intersection or even the entirety of Libby's feet, there's no real way to manage this by logic alone. You also can't move backwards, so if you step too far forward, you have to walk all the way to the next block to try again. At that point, you're essentially toast. Even a little bit of stalling on the correct path means that you'll run out of time, never mind taking Lady Liberty on the scenic route. After two or three failed attempts at the Statue of Liberty walk, I could feel my annoyance with the game starting to bubble up. There are no second chances here. One small mistake or fumble means that you have to raise all the money again, sing to more slime, and build the slime blower just for another opportunity to try this section. Repeating the first parts of the game only to immediately fail was the only real downside of the experience, especially since it never really felt like I got a true handle on those controls. The biggest problem here is that you never know what to do when you get to a new screen for the first time. Even with all the manual's loving guidance, putting it into action under pressure usually doesn't go so well. Getting game over after game over is disappointing, but this trial and error is also where a lot of the challenge comes from. Finally breaking through is what makes those hard-earned victories rewarding, but I can also understand why these kinds of punishing setbacks might put some people off from wanting to play this. I think if they'd allowed you to save your game along the way or even hit a checkpoint after building the slime blower, the experience would have been way too easy. But without all of that, at least in my experience, it meant that you had to execute a virtually perfect run and then also get lucky with the Statue of Liberty path that didn't involve too many turns. The spirit of this one definitely encapsulates 80s arcade difficulty levels, except you can't brute force your way to the finish line with more coins. Once I finally managed to get to the museum to face off with Vigo in all his glory, I immediately had my excitement snuffed out. The reason you need to get here with as many Ghostbusters as possible is because every time you get hit, one of them becomes incapacitated. The first time I got to this point, I only had one guy left on my team since I'd lost the rest to Parkview, so it took me exactly 0.5 seconds to see my hard work come completely undone. Are we ready? Let's go. One, two, three. I'm so scared. And I'm dead. <laughs> I did eventually get back there and got to experience the end of the game after many more attempts. But trust me, if you're going to play this, try to keep all of your pals out of the hospital if you actually want a chance at beating this part the first time you get there. Ghostbusters 2 was a very fascinating experience. It's so different from the majority of what I normally play, but it was fulfilling nonetheless. Working through the different game modes and slowly perfecting the ultimate winning run was some of the most fun I've had with a DOS game to date, though it did take me a while to accept the monotony of starting over every time. Along with its constantly changing game modes, unique presentation, and great music, it felt very fleshed out and complete. If you can find a copy of the manual to guide your gameplay, I definitely recommend taking this one out for a spin. Thank you.